Our guest today, as I had informed in the previous podcast, is Lieutenant General V. M. Bhavana Krishnan, Ati Vishist Seva Medal, Yudh Seva Medal, the Quartermaster General of our Army. In 1998, a study on non-field forces recommended the disbandment of the then 26 pioneer units, and 10 of them were disbanded between 1996 and 1998. However, The Corps proved itself invaluable in its contributions during the Kargil conflict. All of us would remember the legendary horse uh, Chetak of uh, Maharaja absolutely, absolutely. Rana Pratap, as well as uh, the legendary horses of Arjun's, uh, you know, Ashwarath, Saibya, Sugriva, Mega Pushpa, and Balaka. I once again thank you for coming to our show and coming to the platform of Claws. uh thank you uh, and jai hind to all our audience hello and welcome to the youtube channel of center for land warfare studies popularly known as claws an independent think tank on strategic studies and land warfare issues as the audience is by now aware that our center has started a series of podcast inviting senior serving military officers to apprise the nation about the preparedness of indian army to deal with current and likely future security challenges facing the country our guest today as i had informed in the previous podcast is lieutenant general v m bhavana krishnan ati vishist seva medal yudh seva medal the quartermaster general of our army qmg is responsible for logistics of the entire indian army i must add here that we rarely realize the importance of logistics let me inform the audience that we do not realize the presence of logistics but the absence of it the ongoing wars are clearly highlighting this fact so unless the army is logistically prepared we cannot win wars let me put it in simple terms a well planned and executed logistics both during peace and war is the bedrock for success in any battle to tell us more about the functions and activities of the quartermaster general we have today with us the man responsible for the entire logistics cover for the indian army lieutenant general v m bhavana krishnan but before i invite him to this podcast let me very briefly introduce our audience to his profile uh, general bhavan krishnan ati vishist seva medal yudh seva medal is an alumnus of sanic school amravati an nda khadagwasla general officer commissioned was commissioned in june 19 88 from IMA Dehradun into the Dogra regiment the officer has done various career courses uh, and uh, has performed extremely well in those he is double mphil in defense and management studies and defense and strategic studies respectively the general officer has commanded a battalion of dogra regiment the most challenging brigade of our army the siachen brigade and an infantry division in the valley he also has the privilege of having commanded the elite 17 corps he was an instructor at the defense services staff college wellington and above all defense attache at the high commission of india in london i happen to have been there in london while he was while he was tenanting this particular appointment uh, while when i had gone for attending a, a particular seminar the general officer is also colonel of the dogra regiment and dogra scouts with effect from 1st november 2022 the general officer was awarded the yudh seva medal on 26 january 2016 and ati vishist seva medal on 26 january 2022 he is presently holding the appointment of quartermaster general and if i were to put it in simple words the annadata of indian army there is an old saying that the army marches on its stomach and general krishnan ensures that for all of us a very warm welcome to you general krishnan to this particular podcast of ours thank you very much sir uh, i think it was very well put that uh, the absence of logistics uh, you know is always sorely felt and uh, well uh, i'm happy to be here in the podcast uh, and cross uh, is a very distinguished and fine institution and the think tank of uh, the indian army and i'm honored to be here with you sir uh, thank you very much jan krishnan in fact uh, i'll straight away launch into the uh, session essentially to cut on time uh, 
I want to ask you, could you provide a overview of your responsibilities, role, task, charter, etc., which uh, mostly people are not aware of our country. So uh, over to you with that first uh, little question. The quartermaster general is amongst the principal staff officers to the chief of army staff. And he is responsible for all matters uh, Q, as we call in the army. Uh, amongst the responsibilities they have as a quartermaster general, first and foremost is the planning and provision of land and accommodation for the army establishments, as well as environmental conservation and management. And uh, responsible for monitoring, provisioning of transport, supply, fuel, oils and lubricants, and of course, rations. Monitors the purchase, training, breeding, health and efficiency of all animals right till the disposal in the army. And one is also responsible for provisioning of canteen and postal services. And the quartermaster general also monitors the functioning of the pioneer code, which provides a disciplined and well-trained manpower. And I also have an administration and coordination directorate, which is intended for providing administration and logistic support for the Army headquarters here at Delhi. The Indian Army is focused on quality assurance, timely delivery of services, technology absorption, and optimal employment of all its resources. And towards these larger goals of the Indian Army, the Quartermaster General's branch, building upon the solid foundation over the decades, implements measures to further enhance the quality of rations and habitat, ensure infusion and absorption of technology, and optimal utilization of units, personnel, animals, and equipment, and thereby ensuring combat readiness. Uh, thank you, General uh, Krishnan, for that brief peek into your role and responsibilities. While you were covering your uh, uh, response, I heard the word environment as part of your uh, LW and E. Uh, is it a, a new uh, entry into your lexicon or it has been there from the past as well? Military stations and cantonments, I would call them the green lungs of the town, city or the rural belt where they are. And to give this a special focus, the environment was added on to the land and works a couple of years back. Okay. And uh, now it is an established vertical within the land, works and environment. And uh, by virtue of uh, providing that E, we have re-emphasized the importance which the army has always given to the environment. I, I, I think it's in tune with our 2047 goal of being a developed uh, Viksit Bharat with uh, the environment being part of our, uh, our scheme of development. Uh, moving on to the next question which I have for you is that uh, could you inform our viewers about the directorates that fall under your purview because I believe you possibly control the most number of directorates which are functioning under you, almost seven of them. So could you give us uh, a brief preview as to what are their fundamental roles and general achievements? As you correctly said, sir, there are a total of seven directorates under the Quartermaster General's branch. And I shall now cover upon uh, each aspect of these directorates. First is the Supplies and Transport Directorate, uh, uh, which is responsible for the Army Service Corps. In fact, it is the line directorate of the Army Service Corps, which is the oldest and the largest administrative service of the Army and is into its 264th year of its existence. The ASC is responsible for provisioning, procurement, and budgeting of petroleum products, hygiene chemicals, dry supplies, tinned and dehydrated items of rations. In addition, it also handles the mechanical and animal transport of the Indian Army. The Corps ensures a very robust supply chain while maintaining stringent quality control in accordance with what we have as the defense food specifications, which are continually revised. The major contribution of this ASC would include vital roles during various conflicts, the Indo-Pak conflicts of 48, 65, 71, 
the Chinese aggression of 1962, the internal operations in Hyderabad and Goa, and also the Indian peacekeeping force operations in Sri Lanka, and the ongoing counter-terrorist operations in Jammu and Kashmir and in the rugged high-altitude areas. The Corps did a yeoman service in the treacherous terrain in Kargil sector during the Kargil conflict of 1999. And in fact, many of us are not aware that 874AT Battalion, a battalion based out of Udampur, which was moved into the Kargil sector, was awarded the Chief of Army Staff Unit Citation for its sterling performance during Op Vichar. In fact, the role of honor of the Army Service Corps includes a Mahavir Chakra, four Kirti Chakra, 14 Veer Chakra, 23 Shaurya Chakra, and 114 Sena Medals. Moving on to the Land, Works and Environmental Directorate about which we had a small conversation. The scope of this directorate has expanded over the years, starting off as an additional directorate for land and works into now a full-fledged directorate of land, works and environment. It is responsible, as I said, for provisioning of and planning of land and accommodation for all army establishments and units. And it also focuses on matters relating to ecology and environmental conservation and these days also into the utilization of non-conventional sources of energy. Okay. The Army Postal Service is a, again a directorate which has been serving the Indian Army for very long. It has completed 50 years since raising and we have what is commonly known as the 56 APO and the 99 APO which actually signify the one central base post office and second central base post office. It also has an army postal service center, which is the training establishment located at Kamti. The army postal service ultimately emerged as an independent corps on 1st March 1972 with the emblem Rajhans, which is a flying swan approved by none other than the Honorable President of India. The corps today is a lean organization providing postal and scheduled dispatch service cover, e-commerce delivery, and services like Aadhaar, newspapers, magazines. The field post offices cater for our troops across the country and even on UN missions abroad. The Army Postal Service, I must say, is unique and one of its kind in its composition within the Indian Army. It has volunteer personnel from the Department of Post and Indian Postal Services officers serving on deputation along with directly recruited personnel of the Army. It's in fact an example of civil military synergy which has served our nation and the Army very well. Moving on to the Remount and Veterinary Services Directorate. It is responsible for breeding, rearing and training of Army animals their health management, treatment, immunization, and also the tactical employment of them for military purposes. And once the animals have grown old, then the remount and veterinary core ensures that they are treated with compassion and cared at the unique geriatric centers for our army animals. In fact, it's a full life cycle concept. The court plays a pivotal role in providing animal-based logistics by ensuring the health of army animals engaged in what we call the last mile connectivity. It also provides operational support to our combat teams through military working dogs, both in counter-insurgency and conventional operations. In fact, the court has distinguished itself in various operations during various wars as well as the ongoing counter-terrorist operations as well. Moving on to the Pioneer Directorate, it's amongst the much lesser known directorates of the Indian Army, but has a rich history of contributions to combat logistics support. In fact, in 1998, a study on non-field forces recommended the disbandment of the then 26 Pioneer units. 
and 10 of them were disbanded between 1996 and 1998. However, the Corps proved itself invaluable in its contributions during the Kargil conflict and in fact five new pioneer units were raised in the aftermath of Op Vigil. Both in Op Snow Leopard as well as in the ongoing operations, uh, we continue to use the pioneers and they have played a significant role in ensuring the continuous flow and buildup of logistics. In fact, the Pioneer Corps role is to provide disciplined and well-trained manpower where civil labor is either not available or its employment may be precluded for security reasons. The tasks laid down for our pioneers are to provide guards and escorts for headquarters and administrative and logistic establishments, and also for loading, unloading, and carriage of stores and equipment, and also to operate with store holding installations and engineer units. Moving on to the last of my directorate, the Canteen Services Directorate, which impacts our veterans as well as serving soldiers and families. This started off as a public limited company with a working capital of 48 lakhs in 1948. And then in 1977, the CSD, as it is popularly known, became a government department. The main objectives of the canteen services are, firstly, to provide consumer goods of high quality at a very competitive price and ensure consumer satisfaction of its 45 lakh beneficiaries, which includes serving defense personnel, veterans, and families. And while doing this service, it also generates a reasonable level of profit, essentially to sustain the organization and its growth and provide additional facilities for troops and their families. Well, uh, General Krishnan, I think uh, that was a good bird eye view of what your direct your directorate is uh, your branch is doing. Uh, I'm reminded of two three things, you know, when we talk of uh, QMG's branch, and the first one is that you know uh, when we control a particular organization, in the management parlance we say that uh, eight is the span of control. So you are just about short of that eight uh, figure that you have seven entities to control and the second thing which i noticed and possibly which i want the people of india to know is that you are spanning your activity right from operations to peacetime from operations to veterans i think that's a huge uh, spectrum of activities which you have to look after and my compliments for that. Moving on to your uh, uh, next question which is uh, you mentioned about the uh, ST Directorate or the Army Supply Corps which is responsible for meeting the requirements of our field forces in terms of rations, fuel and transport. Could you highlight the initiatives being undertaken to enhance the capability of the Corps and elaborate on how are we preparing for theaterization? You, you understand that Today, the buzzword is that we are moving towards the integrated theater command concept. So, how is the uh, ASC being geared to meet that challenge, especially that it has a huge operational role? And how will it transform into uh, a, a very essential part of the theaterization process? As you correctly brought out, sir, the Army Service Corps is also at the leading edge of transformation and uh, as part of uh, the Indian Army's efforts towards uh, uh, technology absorption. In fact, the Indian Army designated the years 2024 and 2025 as the years of technology absorption and the decade from 2023 to 2032 as the decade of technology transformation. And, uh, as part of this, we have been taking a number of initiatives from ensuring that technology is used in both ration and transport management to revolutionizing the last mile delivery 
The animal transport has been the mainstay of last mile delivery all these decades. And with the development of infrastructure and technology, we are looking at multiple options. We have introduced all terrain vehicles and rugged terrain vehicles capable of carrying about 500 to 250 kgs on narrow operational tracks. We also are in the process of introducing heavy logistic cargo drones and also looking at modern warehousing, learning from our own industry and its best practices. So therefore, the modernization of our major supply depots are also underway. And of course, uh, logistics cannot be without a third dimension. Yeah. And with the modern aircraft being inducted into the Indian Army, the ASC is keeping itself a pace to ensure that it is able to capitalize on this with introduction of technology in this field as well. Moving on to the ration management, um, we have been continually reviewing our defense food specifications as well as are in tune with some of the measures taken at the national level. So towards this end, we have introduced fortified rights as per the governmental initiative. And also we have introduced special rations to our troops deployed in high altitude areas. Millets have been introduced last year okay. as part of the International Year of the Millets. And uh, this would be a major game changer going forward. We also have introduced the Global Standards 1, which ensures that all our supplies are tracked right from the source till the end. And as per the mandate of the government of India, we have gone into the gem portal uh -huh. for procuring all our rations as well as the hygiene and chemicals also. And of course, I did talk about the FSSAI's self-certification model. And this has been rolled out this year for a few products. Mm -hmm. And we will learn our lessons as we go forward. Okay. Moving on to the FOL or the fuel, oil and lubricants and the transport management. Uh, we have introduced modern aircraft refueling pumps, which as the Director General would be aware, has replaced the old Sudan pumps, oh. which were yeah. the mainstay of refueling our helicopters in the forward I, areas. I do remember that. And uh, we have also introduced simulators in a big way and even for our Agni Veeves, okay. so that it can provide them with great confidence when they are undergoing their advanced military training prior to passing out back into the units. We, are also, we have also taken a number of measures to reduce the carbon footprint by introducing uh, electrical vehicles mm -hmm. in the Indian Army in phases. And we are also going to introduce Bharat 6 okay. compliant vehicles Standards. and of course also E20, that is ethanol 20, okay. will also be introduced in the times to come. We are already with E10 as the mainstay of our fuel. And moving towards theaterization, mm -hmm. which the Director General mentioned, yeah. uh, synergy in logistics is an imperative for the Indian Defence Forces. And therefore, to foster joint logistics, the Defence Forces have set up three joint logistic nodes and many more are in the pipeline. And we are looking at about 51 joint logistic nodes across the country. And for this, we need a sound understanding, cross-staffing, and joint training of our staff. And that is very much underway to enable further integration of our joint logistics. Well, uh, General Krishnan, I think that gives a very good overview of the ASC. 
uh, a very very important service of our uh, army i am reminded of you know certain things which you said during your uh, uh, when uh, during your talk uh, i was reminded of special rations above 20000 feet and uh, when we were youngsters and i was posted somewhere in the east uh, we used to travel a lot uh, on you know various kind of transports and modes of transports were there and there was one uh, this bridge along that particular ro- route which was known as the anda bridge you know uh, the then i you know got uh, thinking as to you know why this bridge is known as anda bridge and later on once i interacted with my uh, my colleagues and uh, my uh, jawans etc they said sir if you are this side of the uh, bridge you don't get that additional leg but if you are on the other side of the bridge you get that additional leg so i think that was a good uh, thing which you said that now from 12 i mean now the special rations are available from 12000 feet that has definitely impacted the uh, morale of our uh, jawans and which is a very good step uh, i have uh, two three quick questions and i think thereafter we move to the next one firstly you spoke about the last mile delivery and uh, there is this thing called force substitution which uh, goes along with it can you uh, highlight about that what exactly is that uh, well sir uh, as part of force substitution in fact in this context i would say substituting the animal transport with alternate means for okay. last mile delivery i get that as the uh, intention of your question and uh, i spoke about all terrain vehicles and yeah. other terrain vehicles Correct. and for that we need the infrastructure to keep pace okay uh then considering the rugged terrain we have uh we also have to speed up our logistics and therefore we also are going in for heavy cargo logistic drones okay and we also are working towards uh, developing designing and developing within our country in tune with the governments and the nations i would say atmanirbhar bharat robotic mules okay and we are working with the industry industry and research institutions of our country in developing robotic mules also as part of force substitution for the animal transport oh well uh, that was a good uh, explanation of this term because i keep uh, hearing about this term in the in the strategic uh, and security community uh, moving on to the next question you see uh, one of the major major factors today in uh, i would say environment protection climate security etc has been the pollution which takes place and the indian army's footprint especially of the carbon is very high especially in the frontier areas whether it is the north or the east so what is the indian army's initiative now to reduce this footprint of the carbon so that while we we need to have the infrastructure we need to have all the uh, stuff going up right up to the last mile uh, we also take measures to ensure that the carbon footprint is reduced in tune with the overall national objective you are absolutely correct sir uh, the indian army as i mentioned earlier also is absolutely conscious of the need to preserve our pristine environment in the forward areas and also is at the forefront of ensuring that the environment in the hinterland where we are based and continue to train is well taken care of. uh towards the national effort at reducing the carbon footprint the army has been taking measures over the years in fact if uh, the director general would remember we used to have coal fired bukharis uh in the earlier days yes even the wood bukharis used to be and, there and a lot of untoward incidents used to happen because of that and then we transitioned on to kerosene bukharis yeah and uh, we continue to improve our system as we go forward we have also introduced and are carrying out trials with lightweight high density polyurethane lpg cylinders 
of okay. 10 kgs. And we are quite confident as we go forward in perhaps the years to come, we may be able to partly substitute the K oil with okay. LPG. In the recent times, uh, we have started introducing electrical vehicles into the army. We have six electrical vehicles flying in the army headquarters mm -hmm. under the administration and coordination directorate, which I mentioned okay. is responsible for providing logistic support to the army headquarters. We have plans to introduce electrical vehicles in a major way. And with the technology developing further, we're quite confident that we would transition into alternate technologies in the decades to come. Mm -hmm. Concurrently, we also have to develop the EV infrastructure, mm -hmm. which we are working on. We are also planning to introduce hydrogen fuel cell technology. In fact, I'm quite happy to inform the audience that we have partnered with IOCL okay. for trialing a 37-seater hydrogen fuel cell bus mm -hmm. at Delhi. It's currently operating uh, for the commuters, the soldiers and the officers from their place of residence to the army headquarters and back. We have also, in tune with the governmental initiative, introduced Ethanol 10 and we are in the process of formulating a roadmap for introducing E20 petrol while of course taking due cognizance of its impact on logistics, storage dynamics, as well as its ability to operate in the rough and tough terrain form. So these are some of the initiatives we are taking as far as uh, reducing the carbon footprint with respect to our supplies and transportation. I shall cover about uh, the other green aspects uh, as we go forward. Uh, thank you, uh, Jan Krishnan, for that peek into how the army is now in tune with uh, the overall national goal of reducing the footprint of carbon, which is a very, very important aspect of our uh, environmental protection. Uh, coming on to the next question, which is related to land, which is a major, major responsibility as far as the QMG is concerned. And you always uh, come into the news uh, as far as this particular aspect is uh, there. Uh, Indian Army uh, is, you know, uh, dealing with land. Possibly it is the largest land holder in the country. Uh, after railways, so railways uh, has the number one spot. So, so from that perspective, how, can you enlighten our viewers how this land is being utilized and how its use is being aligned with the recent government initiatives? You know, uh, allaying the misgivings which are there in the environment, which I briefly alluded to in my you know opening remarks as far as this question is concerned. So, give out the facts, you know, so that public is at rest as to what the army is doing and how it is going about it. Well, sir, as you correctly brought out, the defense is amongst the largest of the land owners or land holders, I would say. However, the land which the defense holds and the Indian army holds is for specific military purposes. Land is required for basing our units across Land is required for both individual and collective training and also for administrative infrastructure. If I can give an analogy, in the game of football, mm -hmm. you have two teams playing with 11 players each. Means you need a football field of the size of 100 meters by 60 meters. And in that field, you have 22 players play. Now, that essentially comes down to two sections worth of troops perhaps carrying out training. Yeah. So, when you have to carry out training as a company or a battalion or as a combined arms entity, 
yeah. or perhaps as a division, you need land to be able to carry out your maneuver operations as well as defensive operations. So therefore, you need to train on ground. And I must add here that you have long range weapons, you know, that require more than the analogy Absolutely. which you actually uh, painted. So you require huge tracts of uh, land as far as realistic training is concerned. Yes, absolutely. And uh, you need to, as you correctly said, so to have realistic force on force training Abs absolutely. to be able to always be combat ready to defend our nation. Having said that, uh, the land requirement for the Indian Army has been re revised mm -hmm. and uh, in 1991, we finally reduced our land requirement by a whopping 41.8%. That's, that's huge. Yes. And uh, uh, we continue to uh, acquire land, of course, especially in the forward areas, to build our infrastructure and also construct roads as well as railway lines. And in this, we follow the land acquisition, rehabilitation, resettlement bill of 2030 so that the landowners are suitably compensated. We are also conscious of our responsibility towards nation building. And therefore, whenever land is required for public infrastructure, we have a system of online land management system portal where the state and the central government institutions can file in their requirement of defense land for public infrastructure and we consider each one of those requests on the merits and facilitate execution of those public infrastructure projects. In fact, in the recent times, we have enabled 18 public infra projects across the country. We are also conscious of the connectivity issues mm -hmm. of the citizens of our country who are living around and outside the cantonments. And we have in recent times opened 19 of our roads in nine cantonments for the use of general public. And again, there is the need for expanding our telecom infrastructure and thereby providing connectivity to our citizens. And therefore, Army is part of the Gati Shakti Sanchar portal okay. of the government. And on this portal, whenever telecom operators need to install mobile towers, they file their applications and we process them and we grant them the necessary permission in accordance with the guidelines given by the Ministry of Defence. In fact, we have granted more than 200 permissions uh, since the portal went live on 22nd June 2023. Uh, therefore, I would like to assure the audience that the defence land is put to good use for the defence of our nation. And the Quartermaster General is amongst uh, the people responsible for management of defence land, while the Director General Defence Estate is the custodian of all defence on behalf of the Ministry of Defence and is also the custodian of all defence land records, which have been digitised. Well, uh, thank you, uh, General Krishnan, for that uh, response. While you were uh, giving out your reply, I uh, took note of the fact that by virtue of doing certain actions, certain uh, readjustments, we have been able to reduce our land requirement by 41 point some percentages. Uh, it's, a, it's a very huge uh, drop in the requirement. Can you uh, highlight to us exactly what we did to ensure that uh, our land requirements are uh, cut down so that uh, we overall contribute towards the nation uh, building as such. Land requirement of the army. And uh, 
using uh, the latest technology as well as uh, uh, going high as per as construction of our administrative and uh, infrastructure and habitat uh, we have been able to bring down our land requirements substantially okay. uh, also i suppose the technology must have been used to uh, you know uh, uh, reduce the requirement of ranges etc so that you are able to use exploit more of simulator and uh, such like things and also the new technology uh, can be used to uh, i suppose reduce the range requirements length etc those also must have been there we, uh, uh, we have come up with uh, in collaboration with the drdo the baffle ranges yeah so that which have uh, reduced our land requirement for long ranges uh, and simulators are being used uh, however uh you would agree so that uh, for any army to be combat ready yeah because uh, wars are going to be fought with uh, live bullets and live shells and therefore there is no substitution for a realistic for training live and realistic training. absolutely i mean your that point is given absolutely without that we will not be Uh, able to achieve what we are uh, meant to do uh, coming on to the uh, question related to this only is about the infrastructure you know qmg branch is also responsible for development and construction of infrastructure which is progressing very rapidly so what are the challenges uh, which are faced by you or for that matter by the indian army uh, in execution of the construction of infrastructure and what are the mitigation measures that you are adopting well as the director general is aware that uh, the indian army is spread across the country yeah. from some of the uh, roughest and toughest of terrains in high altitude jungles in monsoon hit prone areas and uh, riverine terrain and therefore uh, each of these terrain along with their peculiar weather conditions impose their own challenges in rapid infrastructure development so therefore we have to plan well ahead to be able to construct our infrastructure in time secondly we are spread across multiple stations to be able to be ready to move at short notice to the borders or across the country especially with respect to hadr operations as well so being spread across multiple stations and being deployed in some of the roughest of the terrains in the world there are challenges however we have to prioritize our infrastructure development and we are conscious of uh, that and the need to put our money to wise use in time so amongst the focus of infrastructure development of the indian army are to build up our roads and railway lines for strategic connectivity and operational connectivity the ammunition infrastructure which is very important for any war fighting we also focused on modernizing our military hospitals and we in fact have undertaken a road map for construction of 14 state of the art base hospitals across the country okay training of course is the bedrock of any combat ready military and therefore training infrastructure is always a key focus both in what we call as category a training establishments which comprise of training establishments for each line directorate as well as officers training establishments and the agnivir training establishments which are our regimental centers so allotment is being made specifically for these training establishments as well especially our requirement for agnivirs 
and of course the married accommodation for our troops and the basing of units across our country and while doing this we also have taken advantage of the new technologies which are proliferating across the country including the light gauge steel frame as well as 3d printing the 3d printing we have started off in a very small scale mm -hmm. okay and of course we have revised our processes and we have gone in for epc contracts as well to speed up the construction of infrastructure across the country uh, thank you jan krishnan uh, you mentioned something about ammunition and uh, you have seen in the ongoing russia ukraine war also uh, in the other conflicts which are going around the world in fact uh, just to uh, inform you there are about 30 conflicts which are ongoing across the globe and that's a huge number one thing which has come out loud and clear is about ammunition how do you manage the ammunition so uh, when we look at our own uh, ammunition uh, management system uh, we are moving towards theaterization some integration is also taking place there are number of commonalities also in certain ammunition i i won't say in everything but certain ammunition categories so uh, are there any tri service initiatives also being taken uh, if you are aware of it uh, as far as the, the ammunition management is concerned if you are aware could you throw some light on that uh, very much sir and uh, as we move towards joint logistic node and theaterization uh, we have plans to take advantage of uh, each service ammunition infrastructure based on station stroke operational requirement okay and of course on the availability of sufficient surplus storage space okay to ensure that each other service ammunition is also catered for in the ammunition storage of other services uh well uh, moving on to the next question since you had said that you are going to elaborate upon it uh, more you know when we are talking about the carbon footprint so could you elaborate on the indian army's green initiative aimed at supporting the environment as it advances towards modernization because that would help in reducing the carbon uh, footprint to a, a great extent absolutely true sir uh, the indian army as i mentioned is always at the forefront of uh, green initiatives and our military stations uh, are the green lungs of any city town or even the rural belt of our country and uh, planting of trees has been ingrained in every soldier and officer in the indian army right from the time we joined our services and going beyond this we have a couple of other initiatives as well okay i would like to touch upon uh, the landfill mukt arm which we have set ourselves last year uh, it goes by the acronym amsa or apashisht mukt sainya abhiyan and uh, towards this end we have created certain phases of uh, rolling out this uh, project and in the phase 1 we have nominated one station in each command to become landfill free and this is also in accordance with the government of india's solid waste management rules 2016 okay and we have ambitious plans to have all the 306 military stations landfill free in the next 5 years towards this end we have been carrying out door to door awareness campaigns mm -hmm. and educating everyone about the segregation of waste and its subsequent disposal as well our revised scales of accommodation for the different services which were revised in 2022 enable provisions for 
environmental management and works such as composters, shredders, incinerators, along with allied infrastructure. Even rainwater harvesting, arboriculture, and energy efficient devices, which could all be executed through our defense works procedure. We also have tie ups with the National Thermal Power Corporation. Okay. And we are rolling out a microgrid power plant, hydrogen power plant at Chushu in Ladakh which would generate 200 kilowatts of green hydrogen electricity through the plant which would be established over there. And uh, this would entail a solar power plant for hydrolysis of water to produce hydrogen, mm -hmm. which during the non-solar hours will provide power through fuel cells. Okay. We're also into solarization in a fairly big way, we have completed 68 projects with a cumulative capacity of 84 megawatts, including at the Siachen base camp. We also have signed an MOU with NTPC for direct purchase of 25 megawatts of solar power for our Delhi cantonment. And we are also exploring in conjunction with NTPC for establishing solar plants in certain large defense land tracts. Uh, moving on to the afforestation drive, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. over the past two years, uh, more than 1.4 million trees have been planted across military stations using traditional methods and scientific techniques. And this year, in tune with our Honorable Prime Minister's initiative, on the World Environmental Day, we have rolled out the campaign of eight paid Maka Na, and this has gained huge traction across the Indian Army. And as per the latest numbers we have, we have planted 44.85 lakh trees across the country. Okay. Also, the World Environmental Day had set out a global theme for land restoration, desertification, and drought resilience under the slogan, Our Land, Our Future, We Are the Generation Restoration. Towards the aim of uh, spreading the awareness of green initiatives across the Indian Army, we also have rolled out competitions for the best clean and green station every year with effect 2021. And this focuses on decarbonization efforts and afforestation. And also, as part of the governmental initiative, we have the Griha norms and each building which is constructed, which is over 20 crore, is mandated by the Defense Works procedure to obtain a three-star Griha rating. And in fact, sir, the new Talsana Bhavan, which is under construction in Delhi cantonment, would be a four-star Griha compliant building. Uh, well, thank you, uh, General Krishnan, for that overview of the initiatives which uh, the Army is taking. In fact, I am reminded of a study which I had carried out uh, in uh, War College and it was related to exploiting the rooftops of the Indian Army. It was a, it was a major study and uh, this was done on our own initiative. We just wanted to calculate the kind of potential which we have and you will be amazed that if we are able to somehow exploit that potential, it will be land into two. So whatever potential we have on our land, just double it up. That is the kind of potential which we will have both in terms of solar and as well as uh, terrace uh, gardening, etc. There are so many uh, areas where we can contribute both organizationally and individually. 
moving on to the next question which is now we are getting into the more interesting part and the more lighter part of your uh, uh, work and which is about the animals you know could, can you highlight what are the different kinds of animal which the indian army employs and how do you exploit them during their uh, prime air or during their operational abilities and thereafter how do you dispose them of as they lose out on their uh, on, the, on on their productivity uh, before i take on the question of animals uh, touching upon what uh, the director general mentioned about uh, rooftop solar potential yeah. yeah so in tune with uh, the nation's initiatives on rooftop solarization the army under the enc branch is looking at uh, yes. going rooftop in a fairly big way uh, taking advantage as you said that it can uh, actually free up the land for Correct. more productive use Correct. at the same time taking advantage of uh, the rooftop Absolutely. for uh, producing more renewable energy yeah. so moving on to the animals uh, yeah. uh, animals have always been part and parcel of uh, mankind and uh, and and therefore it was a very natural progression for what i would say the human animal bonding or teaming these days uh, man machine teaming is the buzzword uh, but i would say much before that from times immemorial mm -hmm. the human machine bonding for civilizational purposes as well as war fighting has always been there and uh, i think uh, all of us would remember the legendary horse chetak of maharana absolutely absolutely rana pratap as well as uh, the legendary horses of arjun's uh, you know ashwarath saibya sugriva mega pushpa and balhaka uh, animals have always been used in the military for their unique capabilities uh, uh, today we are talking about animal transport Uh, but then essentially uh, right from the mahabharat times uh, the horse driven chariots as well as the cavalry were at the forefront of war fighting and of course as we move further forward in times the dogs which is considered the humans best friend because of their unique capabilities uh, have always been a force multiplier with their extraordinary sense of uh, smell as well as hearing and also watching and okay. uh, of course uh, the mules uh, have been uh, the uh, i would say the mainstay of our last mile connectivity over the century and perhaps even more and uh, therefore the remote and veterinary core has had a deep bonding with the animals and uh, uh, the remount and veterinary course motto in fact is pashu seva asmakam dharma which translates into service to animals is our duty yeah. in fact i would say both the asc and the rvc through their animal handlers and dog handlers uh, have a great sacred bond as i would say a heartwarming sacred bond uh, which is reflected in their day to day you know uh, humans and animal relationship uh, moving on to the different kinds of animals we already touched upon uh, mules and dogs and uh, horses of course the horses are currently used in uh, training academies like uh, the national defense academy in fact uh, the indian military academy the officers training academy the defense services staff college and of course also in the national cadet corps units across the country to impart equitation training to our future leaders of the armed forces in fact uh, equitation training has immense potential for developing leaders in addition the horses are also bred by the remount and veterinary corps for use by the presidential body guards in their ceremonial events we also have sporting horses which have brought 
laurels in various equestrian events at the national and international level. Moving on to the dogs, uh, uh, we have different types of dogs, uh, various breeds uh, employed in the Indian Army. Uh, we have the German Shepherds, the Belgian Malinois and the Labrador Retrievers. We also have introduced indigenous breeds like the Mudol Hounds, okay. the Chipipare, the Rajapalayam, the Kombai and recently the Rampur Hounds as well. These dogs are trained for a variety of roles uh, from assault dog to guard dogs to tracker dogs, infantry patrol dogs, explosive and mine detection dogs, narcotic detections, avalanche rescue dogs, and search and rescue dogs. In fact, the performance of the army dogs or the military working dogs as they are scientifically called and their handlers has been brilliant. And uh, they have been, there have been umpteen instances where the dog's powerful sense of uh, hearing, smell and seeing have enabled us to detect explosives, bombs, mines, thereby saving precious lives, not only of military personnel, but civilians as well. And they have been also successful in enabling us to track fleeing militants and neutralizing them. And uh, towards this great contribution of the military working dogs, they have been bestowed with a number of awards yeah. by a grateful nation. The exploits of tracker dog Mansi, assault dog Zoom and Axel, and very recently the tracker dog Kent are recounted with reverence, laid down their lives in the service of the nation. The army dog Kent, about whom I mentioned, was recently awarded the prestigious Mention in Dispatches Award on 15th August 2024 and its handler. Rajkumar Umare was awarded Sena Medal for Gallantry. So in total, I would say the canine warriors have been bestowed with a number of awards by a grateful nation. Our search and rescue dogs have been pressed into service, not only in the recent Wayanad landslides, but also in many search and rescue operations across the country, notably in Uttarakhand and Himachal Pradesh in recent times and even in Sikkim. Moving on to the training of army animals and the troops of Remount and Veterinary Corps, we have the Remount and Veterinary Corps Training Center and College at Meerut. And this is the alma mater of all RVC personnel. And it imparts training to officers and men of the RVC, as well as other arms and services and including paramilitary forces and friendly foreign countries. Okay. The center also has a state-of-the-art dog training facility where various specialities of army dogs are bred, reared and trained into potent forces. It also has an equine disease-free zone mm -hmm. which uh, is undergoing certification and once it gets a certification, it would be a force multiplier in our equestrian events abroad. The RVC also has two, two important establishments called the Equine Breeding Studs. They are located at Babugad in Uttar Pradesh and Hisar in Haryana, where equines are bred and trained before they are supplied to the rest of the arm. We have for that training two remount training schools and depots at Saranpur in Uttar Pradesh and Hempur in Uttarakhand. And one of the important questions which keep coming to us, not only from within the army, but also from the uh, civil fraternities, what do we do with the animals post their retirement from service? All the animals, uh, if uh, 
the director general would recall just a few moments back i talked about the sacred bonding yes. between the uh, the handler animal and handlers and the animals so all the animals which have served the nation and completed their service are transferred back to geriatric care centers and lead a life in the company of other such animals and they are accorded the best possible care and support one more institution i would like to highlight to the audience is uh, the central military veterinary laboratory which is co-located with the rvc center at meerut it is a less known institution even amongst the military fraternity it is an nabl accredited premier veterinary laboratory of the indian army it provides investigational diagnostic referential and research services relating to diseases of army animals the lab has a unique distinction of being a national referral laboratory for a number of animal and zoonotic diseases in fact it played a very premium role during the covid 19 crisis well general krishnan i think uh, uh, whenever we talk about animals uh, one does tend to get emotional because uh, we are all uh, we are both from the infantry and uh, we have had so many opportunities where these dogs have proved to be our saviors at times they have given us leads which lead to a, a very successful operation i was also in the nhg and i found that uh, they were really a very great asset in fact i'm reminded of a incident or or a story which one of the engineers uh, boys said you know he used to he was responsible for demining so they carry out demining with the technical equipment and then that is followed by the dogs and and their handlers to actually Uh, smell the mines out or smell the explosive out so i asked him you know i asked that engineer's uh, boy i said whom do you trust more your your technical equipment which you are trying to uh, locate the mines or you trust the dogs he said sir i trust the dog 98.88% and i think that tells the story in a very 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 short and a brief manner as to what kind of a role the Uh, dogs or for that matter any animals play as far as the army is concerned uh, moving on to a next quick short question and which is how does the rvc contribute towards uh, atmanirbhar bharat i think uh, there is something which you would like to highlight on this particular issue indeed uh, uh, the rvc contributes towards atmanirbhar bharat in its own way and uh, to give you a few examples uh, uh right from june 2008 uh, and you know the rvc has been at the forefront of breeding zanskar ponies which are native to ladakh Clark. and this project has been successful mm-hmm. and uh, in recent times uh, uh, they have been ferrying supplies uh, uh, deep into the siachen glacier mm-hmm. and uh, similarly the bactrian camels or the double humped camels uh, which are also native to the ladakh region okay. are being used for logistics as well as patrolling in the ladakh sector and in the field of canines i did touch upon the use of indigenous breeds mm-hmm. and uh, the remount and veterinary core has taken the initiative in the last few years to indu- introduce uh, mudol hounds chippy pare rajapalayam and combine well jan krishnan i think uh, uh, although short but i think uh, their contribution does make a difference i'm uh, again uh, reminded of uh, two things as far as uh, this particular animal issue is concerned i am a animal lover so that's why i'm trying to uh, ask a little more questions dogs especially and even the horses for that matter the uh, common public loves Uh, loves them and especially dogs who are trained uh, well trained on the horses which are well groomed and well bred so is there a provision that once the horses and the dogs have outlived their prime uh, uh, age and the prime productive period as i said 
is there a provision by which common public can take them on? Uh, take them as their uh, pet? What do we do with the dogs uh, mm-hmm. after their useful service? Of course, I did mention about uh, uh, taking them to the geriatric care centers. Uh, besides that, uh, we also have a provision for dog lovers to adopt the military dogs and uh, giving an undertaking that the dogs would be uh, taken care of with uh, love and affection and uh, good health as well. So yes, uh, civilians as well as uh, veterans and serving defense personnel are free to seek dogs which have uh, moved beyond their service with the army and are in the geriatric care centers for adoption. Uh, thank you, Jan Krishnan, for that quick response on a query which was possibly concerned with the common public as well. Uh, and coming on to the last, I suppose, and the final question of this podcast. And as I always say, it is always meant for the veterans. And uh, we are talking uh, are talking here of Canteen Services Department. Could you highlight, you know, what we are doing basically related to quality control, consumer satisfaction and its contribution towards the nation overall as also the veterans? Canteen services, of course, uh, touches the lives of all of us. And uh, therefore, uh, we do take care of the quality of all goods introduced through the canteen stores department. And uh, we have uh, uh, stringent quality control uh, at different stages. Uh, well before a product is introduced into the uh, canteen stores department, uh, the firms are expected to provide us the NABL certification of those products which they intend introducing into the canteen stores department. Uh, could you expand NABL for people to understand? Uh, it's the National Accreditation Board for Testing and Calibration Laboratories. Okay. And in short, it is called NABL. And uh, besides this, after the product has been introduced, we have periodic or random tests. And uh, This is for all goods, food, liquor, as well as uh, uh, the common items like suitcases, uh, mats, and hygiene chemicals. So the whole range of products which are, uh, you know, sold through the canteen stores department have to undergo periodic quality control tests. Okay. We also do on occasional, you know, uh, at occasional times, uh, complaints are also received and Mm -hmm. we carry out the testing of those uh, products Mm -hmm. and uh, if uh, found unfit, appropriate actions are taken against the defaulting firms. So for us, consumer satisfaction, the quality of our products and the affordable cost at which they are introduced into the canteen stores department are absolutely important. This automatically ensures greater consumer satisfaction. Consumer satisfaction is also a function of our processes. And therefore, we try and continue to refine our processes, Mm -hmm. uh, including our online portal for firm demand items, And we are conscious of some of the glitches in the system currently and we are working hard to overcome those glitches and refine the whole process. We have a robust feedback mechanism both at the unit uh, levels of the canteen as well as at the head office. And uh, we take our feedback very seriously and try and improve our processes. Uh, Another word which I would like to uh, tell is also that the CSD is not a profit-oriented organization. 
compensation. Yes. And whatever profit which it generates, their reasonable profits, mm -hmm. which are flowed back into the system for the growth of the canteen stores the okay. department, okay. as well as for providing facilities for our troops and the families in the form of quantitative discount and canteen trade surplus, which are slightly technical terms for the common man. But suffice to say, the prof profits are flowed back. It goes these two mechanisms. Yeah, it goes back into the improvement of infrastructure Absolutely. related to uh, the uh, soldiers and, uh, Absolutely. and the entire station, etc. True, sir. And uh, we have a fairly wide network of canteen services. We have 34 area depots and about 3,600 unit run canteens with almost about 45 lakh beneficiaries, mm -hmm. including serving soldiers, their families, veterans, widows, and the next of kids. And uh, certain recent uh, initiatives, as I mentioned, that we are always looking to improve our services. And uh, some of the veteran-friendly initiatives, which I can highlight to our audiences, that we have rolled out a large number of ex-servicemen canteens, unit run canteens and extension counters over the last 10 years to provide better access to our veterans and their families to canteen services. Uh, we also have, uh, considering that the veterans may have to travel uh, long distance perhaps, mm -hmm. uh, especially when the canteen is at a distance. So we have uh, enabled uh, all ranks as well as the veterans to purchase up to one month entitlement in advance okay. so that their uh, frequency of visits to the canteens are minimized. And we also ensure that uh, all our canteens are well stocked, though at times they might find that uh, uh, due to certain issues, uh, perhaps sometimes uh, there could be uh, supply chain issues wherein some of the products may not be available at a point in time. Also to prevent unnecessary hassles in renewing the canteen cards, especially for the veterans and the widows, we have discontinued the annual renewal of canteen smart cards. Okay. And now the cards which are issued are valid for 10 long years. We also have provided a unique canteen card for our V Naris and next of kins of battle casualties. Uh, this card enables easy identification, which ensures preferential treatment and due respect for them. And uh, moving on to contribution to nation building through the canteen stores department. Uh, this is again very little known, but I would like to use this uh, media to give it much greater publicity that uh, <clears throat> as part of Nari Shakti to promote, promote women entrepreneurs, uh, firms having 100% women ownership are provided a concession of approximately 85% in application fees for introduction of new items in the CST. That's a major, major, I think, step. True. Sir. And we also have... Uh, uh, I would say advantages for MSMEs also. We promote them also to introduce their products through the CST. And another thing which I would like to highlight to our audience is uh, in line with Atmanirbhar Bharat, a procurement and sale, if uh, our audience could recall, of about 430 directly imported items were discontinued in the CST in October 2020. This had a very positive impact. In fact, over 250 such items which were discontinued have been reintroduced into the CST once the firms shifted their manufacturing into yes. our very own country, okay. thereby generating employment and revenue for our nation. And lastly, I would like to highlight uh, the Green India Initiative. And uh, in line with uh, our national mission, efforts are being made to popularize sale of electrical vehicles 
and hybrid cars through the CST. Towards this end, 23 electric vehicles, 47 hybrid and 40 CNG based four wheelers have been introduced in the CST and the sale of electric vehicles have also been further incentivized. Well, thank you, uh, Dhanal Krishna. First of all, uh, as far as uh, this entire CSD uh, stores department is concerned, canteen store department is concerned, I think uh, this is one thing which touches both the service and the veteran uh, fraternity. So there is some amount of uh, interest which gets generated. Uh, in line with that, uh, there is a small query which is uh, rising in my mind. You know, today we find that the uh, digital world has spread all around us. You know, everybody is trying to diversify their sales through uh, e-marketing. So, is there any initiative of this form uh, undertaken, being undertaken in the uh, canteen stores department? And if so, what is the status of that? True, sir. This is the era of uh, digital commerce or e-commerce as yeah. uh, one calls it and in line with this uh, the Ministry of Defence is uh, uh, rolling out a request for proposal for uh, adoption of e-commerce uh, through the area depots of uh, okay. the CST. Uh, it is at the initial stages mm -hmm. and I am quite hopeful and confident that uh, we would be able to roll it out uh, at some point in time going forward and this would essentially be for grocery items okay. and it would uh, uh, enable our veterans as well as serving personnel to be able to order grocery stores online. I think in some form it will also contribute to the nation building because then you will require the delivery mechanism and in the delivery mechanism automatically uh, civilians will have to get involved in it. So therefore, it will overall contribute in some form to the growth of the uh, country. Well, thank you, Jan Krishnan. I think that was a very, very wonderful, good long session and covering seven directorates. It's, so it's a it's a major achievement if I were to uh, just put it in simple words to cover such a large canvas in such a small time. With that, uh, uh, I once again thank you for coming to our show and coming to the platform of clause. Uh, thank you uh, and Jai Hind to all our audience with the promise that this is not the end of our uh, series of calling senior military officers. Keep a watch at the space of class YouTube channel. You will find more such podcasts coming in the next few months. Thank you and Jai Hind. Mm -hmm.